Yeah, I I totally remember that. Um, I'm Jeff is entering at the moment, and then Steve should be in any second. I'm so happy to see you. When was the last time we chatted? It was a while、uh, ago. I don't yeah, when, when you were helping me get a tutor, because、mm-hmm. I'm all out of tutors yeah, at yeah. San Jose State. <laughs> yeah. Catherine,、oh, yeah. check out my shirt. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Pretty、amazing. cool, right? I want to、yes. get you one too. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah.、Um, I think Jeff is still connecting. Oh, were you working with students directly today? Yeah, I actually was. I was in a meeting with.、Um, With Constantine and Elvia and Rom and Valerie and、um, I had to leave the meeting because it was it was too busy. There were like a lot of students waiting. So, oh wow! Hi Jeff. Hey Catherine. Hi Henry. What's up, Jeff? How exciting! <laughs> hi. Hi hi hi. Steve is coming in. Hey Steve. Hey Catherine. Henry. Jeff. What up, Steve? What up? What up? <laughs> you know Catherine, right? Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Catherine, thanks so help- much for having me here.、How、I'm like,、excited. I feel so honored. <laughs> us too. <laughs> And nervous. Yeah, this this is a, a process, right?、Um, I think maybe if it's okay, can we? Yeah, I love that first item. Did Catherine? Do you have access to today's、um, agenda that Henry so nicely put together? I do. Let me let me pull it up right now. Jeff, Steve definitely knows Catherine because Catherine and Michael helped us a ton prepare for our big presentation、oh, uh, cool. with the admin. We still owe Catherine a check. I think I don't think we ever sent that much out. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to spend some time、um, at the start of this, just kind of、um, honoring your presence, Catherine, and really.、Um, You know, reacquainting ourselves just to give you a sense of. I mean, I think maybe you're familiar with some of the stuff that you've been doing. We've been doing, but I, I kind of just want to like get acquainted. What? How is your vision?、Um, each of you. How, what's our vision for the first part of this? That is definitely my focus for today's meeting, and maybe for the next couple meetings. <laughs> awesome. How, how do you feel about that, Steve?、Um, as far as like talking about what we're doing with the agenda, or. Yeah, just, well, just like set, setting special time and energy aside、um, to calibr to like we have a new member, which is really exciting, right? Yeah. <laughs> But it's also a little scary because we like the the three of us bums like trek around a lot, and she's coming into a, a Catherine. You're coming into a scenario where we have a long working history,、um, and so I, w- I want to give space for that and really space for you to explore, etc. How do you feel about that, Catherine? I mean, I'm I'm really excited to be here, and、um, you know, as Henry was saying, I, I feel like it's probably going to take us a little bit of time to like kind of figure out how we, the four of us, all work together.、Um, but I also want to be, you know, respectful and mindful of the fact that the three of you kind of have something like really good going here, and I I want to make sure that I'm able to contribute to that instead of like. Taking you in a different direction or something like that. So,、um, I also want to be here to kind of listen and、um, and figure out how the three of you work together as well. I I would bet money that you、uh, will make this project better. <laughs> Guaranteed. The thing that I that's really important for me, and I think both Henry and Steve have multiple times shown the same thing, is that、uh, I have a feeling that、um, every time we work together is a blessing.、Um, And one thing that I really want to make sure, as as、um, you know, I want to make sure that every time you come, Catherine, and the same thing is true for Henry and Steve, that you're finding that your cup gets filled, <laughs> that you're finding this useful for yourself, and that you find that the work that we're doing is meaningful, that it makes you smile, that it.、Um, I always I think the analogy that we usually work is use is that this is dessert. Right, so like if we think about, I always like to say that the our main jobs are our peas and carrots, so to speak, right? And that this is the sweet stuff that we earn on a daily basis.、Um, and so one thing that I thought a lot about is, 
uh, for your case in particular, Catherine, it, I'm, uh, another thing about me just, in, and maybe Henry and Steve can kind of introduce you to their working um, mechanisms, is I'm, I'm a slow thinker. So I first dreamed up this project in probably 2010 was when the first kernel came. And then I had the project like fully formed in my mind by 2014. Um, and then Henry and Steve really pushed me out of my comfort zone. So the, the reason that we're doing this right now is because of Henry and Steve, bar none. Henry was, I would call the, the, the light. <laughs> and then Steve has friendly, friend, you know, poured gasoline on the fire every step of the way, which has been exciting. Um, but it just, you know, when Henry first came with the idea, it takes me, I have to process all of this. Um, but one thing that I was thinking about as I've been kind of processing the, the wonderful possibility of having you a part of the member of our team is what can we do to inspire and support your career, um, both where you are right now and where you want to go. And so that's a question that I'm going to ask myself that I have been asking myself for multiple months since we met you. Then that I will continue asking myself as we get to know each other so that we as a team are um, really can support and um, provide community around your goals and around what you'd like, right? Great, and thank you for, for thinking of that. I, I know that, you know, in the conversations I've had with Henry, the fact that you're, you're thinking about, you know, his future and Steve's futures and trying to help them get wherever it is that they wanna go. Um, I know that it's been really meaningful and it's been also really inspiring to kind of see how Henry's taken that in, um, in his, his own direction as well, so. Uh, I always like to say, if, if, I, if the amount of work I do for them is one, then the amount of that work they do for me is 1.2. <laughs> like, like, this for me, this is a mutual cycle. Like the two of them have pushed me outside my comfort zone in so many ways. And I've had huge, um, you know, I, I, one of the ways this goes into the kind of the source of the learning code, I define learning as a process of change. And so in that way, and then I define a, a teacher as somebody that helps me learn, right? So I don't, I actually don't think there's any such thing as a teacher. There's only people that can help because the only person that can teach ourselves is ourselves, right? But if I look at a teacher as somebody that inspires change, I can point to many things in my daily teaching career and in my daily workflow that both Henry and Steve has fundamentally changed. So some example of this is at 244, I was, I was recording a podcast I literally, I was for my last post, that's Henry. In Steve's case, I fundamentally changed some of my, um, when I worked with Steve, I would say that my teaching practices were underdeveloped. And I saw in Steve genius that my assessment practices were not capturing. And so after working him in, with, in him in Math 1C, I started changing components of my class in order so, so that when I assessed my students, students like Steve, who I consider to be very gifted and also independent thinkers, I would be able to capture that intelligence on my test. So one example of this that Steve, I, I don't know that I've ever said this to you, but you actually helped inspire this. When, I think I worked with you when I used to give a fraction of the points back on test corrections. Do you remember that? We would. Uh, I don't remember the exact amount, but I, I do know that you did give points back. So one thing that Steve helped me realize was that's a stupid policy because his test corrections were some of the most gorgeous test corrections that I ever seen. And if I were to grade those as an independent document, they should have been an A by, by far, like those should have been an A. But what, what happened is my systems didn't capture that capacity. And so after I worked with him, I actually went through the process of changing so that I, don't, I no longer use a formula to assign a grade for a test correction. Um, and those are, those are two examples, concrete examples of changes that these guys have inspired in my career. I have tons of other ones. Um, you have already changed my life, Catherine, because you are here today, right? <laughs> Which means that your presence changes, I mean, positively benefits this program. Um, and, and I have no doubt that I'm going to learn a ton from you 
given your experiences and given your um, your knowledge about critical race theory, about writing, about structural changes in that are needed in the U.S. education system, and so many other topics that um, that your lived experience have informed, right? So, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> shut up now. <laughs> I was rereading some of the notes that uh, I have in my previous meetings with Catherine, and they are so immense, actually, because I, I, I was doing what I was doing <laughs> in many of our TLC meetings, which is like I was transcribing a lot of her words so I can capture all of it so that I can think about it. And it, the amount of uh, wisdom you shared with me, Catherine, over the summer um, not only made me a much better student, but made me a much stronger advocate for my peers uh, this semester. So, yeah, what a special, <laughs> what a special person you are. Thanks. Well, I'm really excited to to get started. Um, I know that there's a lot to cover on the agenda, so. I um, have a problem with my agendas. I don't think I, we've met at least 14 times since our big presentation. I don't think we've ever finished covering all the agendas. So don't be overwhelmed by my agendas. I'll get better at making more manageable and achievable agendas. Um, but I want to give Ch Steve a chance to say something. I saw him unmute and usually that's yeah. a cue. Uh, awesome. Uh, well, we're glad to have you Catherine. I know Henry always tells us really great things. And I know that and you're like a professional and have professional writing skills. And that's something like Henry is like leading the way with us with how much work he puts in. And Jeff, you know, he has years of writing experience. Me, not so much. So I'm definitely looking forward to get like some feedback in any way so I can improve myself. So um, any help is like, we welcome that here. Yeah. yeah. What's funny about Steve's case is I've brought up brought to him at least a dozen books over the past year that I am just being introduced to. And he's already read at least half of those dozens. So um, in that regard, Steve, you are, I think, more cognitively fit than I am in terms of reading and writing. So don't undermine your abilities in that sense. I think yes. I know, oh, I was just going to say, I think I know a lot about, or a little about a lot, but I don't know a lot about specific, a little bit. Well, Steve, I've also, I mean, you showed us in your presentation, like some of your, some of your notebooks and like, you know, the notes that you take and how you rewrite your lecture notes. And, you know, I'm totally blown away by that. So I've, um, I've got to learn more about, you know, your system. And because I think that's something that, you know, of course, all students should be doing and, and benefiting from. So I have, I have a lot to learn from all of you. <laughs> so excited to get started on this. So thanks again for having me here. Um, one, one thing that I, if you, well, how exciting. <laughs> uh, one thing that I'll say is we, uh, I, I have a really strong feeling the agendas are nice because they capture ideas, but I would say that they're less of, I tend to, um, at the core of this project for me is human relationships, period. Um, the most, I, I wouldn't say the most important. Um, I have a feeling that organizations have a commitment to all members of the organization. So we have kind of, I would say at least three different um, communities that we serve. Um, we have our internal community, which is the group of members that compose our team. We have our target audience, which is current and future generations of students who um, are looking for strategic skills to navigate a complex and difficult system, which is college, right? And then we also have our larger community at Foothill. Um, I would say just the larger higher education community, but if we focus on our Foothill colleagues and staff. Um, and so I like to think about each of those communities and on any given day, I, I really want to do my best to serve those. Um, one way that I I'd say my, my core focus on a daily basis is that when our members come in, each of us feels this is a really valuable thing. Um, I, the way that I always think about this, this is at least a 10 year project, if we do it right. Um, because I, I like to say that this is dessert, um, 
I feel that we as a team should be able to set up systems where we can do this in our quote unquote free time without having to take away from other things, right? And that's not easy because each, you know, I'm involved in full-time teaching. I have two kids. I would imagine that I know Henry and Steve are getting their educations. They're building a career. I know you, did you finish your thesis? That, hey. <laughs> nope, still, still working on that. That's, that sounds really normal. <laughs> yeah. So I know you got that going on. You're working full time. I, I, I can only imagine you're doing like three full time jobs at least. Um, and so I like to say that slower the better. It, uh, Henry and Steve are great inspiration to me. So if, if my proclivity is to put a, a brick on the break, they both kind of counteract that because they have their foot on the gas. And so it's a, for me, that's a really nice balance. But when it comes to the agendas on a daily basis, my prayer is that we focus on community rather than agenda items. And if that means an agenda item moves from this week to next week or next week to the next week or even till next year, I'm not so worried about that because I think the community building part for me is the number one thing. Um, because of that long-term view, I have a sense that the longer we work, the more quote unquote efficient we'll get. But I'd rather start with community and relationships and end with efficiency rather than the reverse, right? Um, so I think one, one thing that I, I, if it's okay, I would love you to have a chance to critically engage with some of our previous, um, or I, I guess, editing rights or maybe responsibility i don't know <laughs> we've uh, we one thing that i tried to do years ago was figure out why i felt this project was important um and so it ended up that i came up with these six core ideas which we uh, we call like the, i don't know what we call those henry or steve do you remember what we named those the mission problem some themes to our mission statement. Do you have a, a quick link to that? Yes. Uh, I kind of want to um, edit our blog, if that's OK. Can I, can I show you what I mean? This, this is a side comment, uh, Catherine. I, I, but I've been playing with, um, so Henry, you've inspired me. I have a lot of work that I need to do. What do you, what do you see on the screen right now? Uh, two finder folders on the top left, oh, that okay, desktop. So that's that one. Let me, <laughs> I chose the wrong screen. Um, so uh, this, our blog is, um, I do more writing for our blog than I do for my personal blog. But one thing that I, I like about the structure of my personal blog, do you see how, um, so if there's these little tabs up front that go to different um, portions of my blog, I don't, I don't necessarily care that we have these, we can, we can't, I don't, there's no strong feeling, but this I do have a kind of strong feeling about. I think it would be really nice um, to have a blog tab where the title of each post, the date that the post was posted, and then also the author. This one's kind of use, unique because we, we're going to have multiple authors, right? Um, and then you, I think you guys have seen that um, in the uh, WordPress blog space, there's that thing that says read more. It's like a, a tab that you can put across, right? And so I always like to think that the first paragraph is really my you know, the hook to get people to read more and then they can click on it. But the nice thing about this is as I scroll down, I see a history from the earliest blog post. And as I scroll up to the later blog post, and I think this would be really nice because right now when I go to the learning blog post, if I go to blog library, if I wanted to scroll through and get links to preview, see it? Mm -hmm. My finger's tired. <laughs> Um, and so I, I haven't figured that out yet. Henry, I can sponsor that item, but I, before I sponsor it, I want to make sure that it's okay that I do that, that I'm not like breaking any rules or anything. I remember you messaged me about this and I've been thinking about it ever since. Uh, yeah, you, 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 you basically said that we need kind of more of a structure for this um, if we want readers. Can I, to can I take that project on? Is that something that I can do? Sure. I thought the reason you didn't is you wanted to give Steve and I a chance to have uh, agency and understanding WordPress a little bit more. But if you if you like, yes. Yeah, Steve, are you clamoring to do this? Because I'm like 
I'd like twitch every time I got on. <laughs> I'm having a hard time with it. Um, no, like feel free to. I mean, I've already actually already experimented. I have like a another side. Well, I keep making blogs. I have like a couple of blogs now. I need to just commit to a couple of them, but just to experiment with the layout and figuring out how the WordPress works. So, um, but feel free because I feel like I've learned already so much. Okay, so then I'll, I'll do that. Um, in the chat, it looks like maybe Henry or Steve uh, grabbed a copy of that, uh, the mission statement at the learning code. Have you had a chance to see that already, Catherine? Yes, I did look through that. Awesome. Um, here's an open invitation. We haven't really set up our editing systems yet. I had a really strong feeling in the early stages of this project that um, I wanted to get in the habit of writing. Um, eventually, I'd like to settle in on the ability to edit each other's work. It's hard to find good editors and also to build trust as editors. And so that's a project uh, for a later date. However, if I think about the uh, one thing that I really like is value driven action. So instead of, you know, um, the way that I always think about decisions is it's really one of the hardest things is the ability to say no to things, right? <laughs> like, like to figure out why the particular decisions we're making are worthwhile, but then also which things do not fit into that category. And so when I think about that mission statement, it kind of encapsulates some of the core structures of the work that I want to do. Um, I think one thing that I want to do in that mission statement is make it more, um, is to center race um, more uh, consciously or more, you know, targeted, I suppose, to make it clear that um, some of the structures in higher education have traditionally done the exact opposite. <laughs> um, but the flip side, though, is that, you know, we have an open invitation to every member to actively create that mission statement and to edit it, because I, I, I define our work as literally that mission statement and so i wrote that but that the moment that you're part of this team it's no longer mine like this is ours which means you have my feeling is we each have uh creative control and responsibility to that mission statement which means that the more each of us can actively refine develop and make that a living document the more the more this becomes a communal project and not just something. And, and the moment that, that happens, I genuinely believe that we each become better from that, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to, I mean, I think once like we all have more conversations about race and, and education and that kind of thing, and I'm sure that you've already had these conversations, but you know, once I think we come to sort of uh, like, I don't know, have collective dialogue about that, then yeah, I'd be, you know, I'd be really happy to, to kind of help to, to shape that aspect of the mission statement. Awesome. Um, one thing that we have not yet done, we're in the process of doing is to write visions, um, basically like a, I, I might call it a business plan um, is the, or vision statement or, um, larger structures about how we leverage the different media. So right now we have at least three different forms of media of, that I use on a daily basis. I guess four if we include Zoom, but that's kind of video. So we have our blog post page, we have our YouTube channel, and then we have a, a, a podcast channel that um, Henry set up. And um, we have, I think right now we have some broad definitions of what we're gonna do with each of those things. And we have been actively refining that to get it down into like a coherent plan that we can leverage on a week to week basis. But there's still a ton of um, writing and thinking and collaborating that we're working on. Um, I don't know, Henry or Steve, if you have some, some ideas to add on this, just to kind of keep her up or get her up to date with some of the stuff that we've been struggling with and thinking about. and. Sure, I can start. Um, as far as the podcasting goes, I think I might have shared this with you, Catherine, on how um, it was a little bit of a failure in the beginning. I was very excited going into creating the podcast page because I was led by Jeff and Steve to read about 
cognitive science and the neurochemistry of how learning works. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm reading all this and I'm spending two hours commuting back and forth. I would imagine at least some of my close friends might be interested in learning some of this with me. So then uh, I, you know, I was listening to a lot of podcasts on leadership and I was like, okay, let me just try making my own. So I would basically type up a script and read. Um, the script is centered around what I learned from our meetings and my own readings but I realized uh, they weren't that engaging. <laughs> the, the episodes weren't engaging enough to um, even maybe entice my closer friends. And then you knew I went on the little spoken poetry uh, tangent to exercise some of my um, creative, uh, I don't know, skills. And that was cool. That was, it was, that was fun. It was, you know, I, I like to be able to schedule more of that in as I continue with my education. Um, but as of late, I, I really, as you, I think you also have noticed, I've been digging into the archives of these meetings uh, because as soon as Jeff and Steve gave me the green light <laughs> to, to publish some of our thoughts, our dialogue, our uh, collective ideas around what learning can be and what education can be, I knew that you know, three, four years ago, this, these are thoughts that not many students are around or even are aware of. Um, so I'm experimenting with medium, long, short formats of video and podcasts at the moment, and it's still a work in progress. <laughs> but what, last thing I'll say, sorry, Steve, is I would say the informal dialogue that we have in these meetings um, is really, really powerful compared to like scripted stuff <laughs> because there's just a, all these elements of authenticity and humility and vulnerability that uh, isn't quite present in, you know, really structured scripted videos or podcasts. So, okay. Oh, I was just gonna mention that. Yeah, so Henry's been like just leading the way in this video production. Like the quality and like content of the stuff that he's putting out there, like I'm just it's it's really amazing to see and see all that growth. Um for me personally, I'm just trying to get with the I'm just going slowly and following with the anchor. I think that's what it was called, and trying to bring our blog post to life because I've seen once again from Henry, I learned he he had like a Spotify attached to his blog post where he reads what he's saying, but it brings the blog post so much more to life without necessarily maybe the struggle of like video production. So I'm kind of experimenting with that right now. So just even if it's a slow start, I mean, anything, um, anything is really welcome. Yeah. yeah, Henry shared some of the, some of the video clips that he's been um, putting together and they're amazing. <laughs> I was, I was telling Henry, he shared one of you, Jeff, that was, um, and he said like Henry's sense of like when to send things to people is like spot on. So like, I totally needed to see that video like on the day that he sent it. So yes, like to, you know, to all the things that you were saying, Henry, about um, conversations being more authentic, like when they're happening in the moment, I think that's really true. In just the couple of things that you sent me, I was able to see that like very immediately um, and recognize that, you know, what you're putting together is, I think is really important. Um, yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed them. Uh, I know Jeff is, you know, he has a really solid plan of how to generate original ideas. Um, he's been working on that for many of his, multiple of his math projects, and he wants to do the same with this. And, you know, Catherine, we've shared conversations on, making sure that whatever resources and services that we provide don't get stuck in the piloting cycle <laughs> at Foothill, right? Like that's that's why we had many conversations on curriculum design and curriculum build versus maybe resources or support resources. Uh, so with all that being said, I think there's value in working with our garage door open per se, like an open notebook, because it's, it, can be helpful. I've seen people do this in art, in music, in sports, in fitness, in food. Um, 
So I'm, I'm so glad that you are willing to try with, with me. So one thing, um, one, so I guess there's uh, some, just some ideas that we've been playing with. Um, both Henry and Steve, I would say, um, when, way back when I was thinking about student life, I kind of broke down development into four different categories. Um, because I recognize on a daily basis, one of the practices that I use in my classes is I, I try to talk with every student in my class one-on-one -on -one at least once every two weeks. Um, so I have a lot to say about that. Um, it ends up that that's actually really hard to do given the structures of our education system, but I'm not bad at it. It is not uncommon for me to have a minimum of 20 individual conversations with every student in my class. That doesn't always happen, but... Um, the one thing that occurs when those conversations happen is that I get a sense of the spectrum of learning needs and life experience across those students. And what I recognize is that what matters most is the student sitting in front of me, not some projection onto that student that the system says I should give, right? And once I came to that realization, I started to realize that students have different developmental needs depending on where they are in their college education. And so I started to come up with kind of a, a mental model for how, um, what the society assumes will happen with students as well as some of the needs that students have, have. So the project, the learning code, I would say is centrally focused on a project that I used to call Conquering College. And I think Henry and Steve kind of came up with a better moniker on that, right? Yeah, I like I, any, I like the learning code way better than the original idea that I came up with, and I one of them or inclusive or both of them uh, pulled pulled the conquering college name and put the learning code, which is awesome. Um, that the idea of that was uh, kind of threefold. The first was that um, I liked the idea of empowering students to be able to set and achieve any academic goal that they wanted. So what what skills can we help them with so that if they go into any class and say, I want this grade in that class, they can achieve it irregardless or irrespective of the teacher teaching that class, right? And so the moment that that comes up, two things came out of this. Number one, so much self-help um, in academics is not grounded in what I would call data science or uh, study, it's grounded in the apprenticeship of observation. What I did, you should do, right? Or what was done to me, I'll do to you, and then you just survive. And so one thing that I wanted to do was to infuse all of those lessons with science-based evidence on how learning works um, as a way to counter negative messages that occur in the system. The other thing that I wanted to do was to have a race-conscious mechanism um, to inspire students, meaning that when they're navigating the system, the system perspective is when things go wrong, it's the student's fault. And I really like the idea of, that's one of the, I think it's the sixth part of that mission statement, which is to help students advocate for systemic change, which is that just because I have to navigate this shitty thing doesn't mean the shitty thing is right and I'm wrong, right? It means the shitty thing is historically based. <laughs> I need to get through it because the system's not going to change in time for me be before I get out, right? But simultaneously, I can also take responsibility for that. And so that those were like kind of the three, the three components of conquering college, or what is now what I would call this learning code project, which is how do we inspire and encourage students to be able to set and achieve any academic goal that they want in any class with any instructor. There's some asterisks on the word any there, right? And can we infuse both what I would call now critical race theory and cognitive science, learning science, so that when we're, we're doing that, we're doing it in such a way that it's informed by deep thinking about both how learning works and also systemic factors that impede learning based on historical prejudice in the United States, right? Um, yeah, babe. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were recording. No. no, no. Um, sorry, sorry. And then, so I would say that that is like 
ground zero and it's the central focus of this. One of the things that I previously, both Steve and Henry had thought about being teachers um, and particularly they have expressed interest in community college teaching. I think Henry's still interested. Steve has since communicated that he might um, go make a billion dollars in data science, I believe, right? Enough to survive on. <laughs> uh, I still am gonna, um, I think Steve has so much to offer and I could just see his students thriving. I also want him to know, Steve, I want you to know like whatever you choose, we support you. It's kind of a testament to this project to recognize that um, even if you were to take a non-teaching path that a lot of the stuff that we're working on is super useful, right? Which means that it transverses um, you know, application, which is really, really powerful because it means that the mechanisms that we are talking about are not limited to academia or limited to industry or limited to government, which is really cool. Um, one thing that I thought a lot about in the development of this working circle is um, what I would call like professional academic inquiry. I was thinking, you know, I, I really like the idea that if these guys want to go into grad school, that we can decrease the cognitive load of grad school. And it doesn't, grad school doesn't matter, Steve. You, grad school means some future learning event, which could be on the job learning, right? Just like taking your education and leveraging it to learn new skills. Grad school is a formal mechanism that we stay in academia, but I would claim that you're going to do the same thing the first few years on your job, right? And so one of the things, Catherine, that I've tried to do is infuse this entire project with um, skill building opportunities for that like professional academic career so that by the time they land in those positions they actually have like we as a team me individually I'm developing it all the time but have a bunch of skills that will make the future um, a lot easier right and so that's kind of the personal self building so like um, one thing that we've worked a lot with is deep reading um, I have like this post on reading systems I'm going to move it over soon in, I don't know how many books I've read for this project. It's, pro it's probably at this point uh, close to 100. That's exploratory reading. Deep reading, we've done, I don't know how many books we've deep, deep read for this project since we started working together, probably around four to five, not all of them finished. Um, I have a specific way that I think about deep reading. Catherine, I can guarantee you have your own mechanisms of deep reading, even if you, I don't know what you call those mechanisms, but I would guarantee that like, just by the suffering that is called PhD research. <laughs> um, and so there's there's a whole bunch of skill building stuff. This is one way in my job. I, are you noticing how hard it is to keep that up in your daily work at Foothill, Catherine? Yes, it's extremely, extremely difficult. Kind of depressing, actually. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is. And, you know, I, I think that you know, when you're talking about this professional academic inquiry, like these are the things that actually are, are things that can like really drive change and transformation, not just with the institutions that we work in and that we work, that we work for, but also personal transformation as well. And it's really interesting that that's not really supported in a, in a lot of places to the detriment of the institution itself, as well as, you know, the people who we work with or the people who benefit from whatever it is that we're creating or that we're trying to put into practice. Yeah, it just makes me cry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I actually feel that also, and I actually live that. Like one of the things that I get out of this is that I get um, to three now scholars who are my teammates who keep me accountable to that work and really push my writing and push my thinking far beyond what I would do by myself. And it's a routine. It's, I kind of look at this like church in some way, right? Like we, I'm committed to showing up. And during this time I do ritual thinking and I use the non-church days in order to support that. Um, and so there's a huge component of this, which is each of us have the chance and the opportunity to build our academic skills and leverage it towards those goals. I personally would love someday if this turned into a book project and we published a book on it. I'm not worried about that right now um, because my feeling, uh, one, my favorite mechanisms of writing books 
that I have seen is when the publisher asks you to write <laughs> right? rather than the reverse, right? Because otherwise, like we're trying to convince the publisher that there's a market. And it's so much, I feel it's so much more powerful if the market for the ideas and the proof of concept already exists. And then the publisher realize what a great opportunity. And I don't really care about that except that I've noticed that in order to drive change and get media attention, usually you have to have a book behind it. And so what I really want is the space of media attention to take this problem more seriously. There are some academic scholars that actually take system transformation in college quite seriously, but because of the incentive structures that exist in higher education, very few people actually act on that change on a daily basis. And much of the space in media that talks about higher education is captured by the idea that colleges function fine. And not only that, but we can put a hierarchy of those. So the finest functioning colleges are Stanford, Princeton, <laughs> Harvard, which I just fundamentally disagree with. I think those are some of the most imbalanced and detrimental places on earth. Um, but in order to have, in order to get to a place where we can drive uh, conversation about that, I think it's there are a number of things to, to happen first. And so what, what I've said with Henry and myself is let's really find ways to leverage this project to grow ourselves and to become more effective. And then to empower other people in our communities, especially thinking about um, either colleagues at work, future students, et cetera. And so really this is a personal, personal local and immediate development development cycle and anything that happens later, we can use to strengthen that fundamental mission and to drive conversations about larger systemic changes that really we owe the current and future generations of people in this system. Um, and so, yeah, so like those, those are some of the structures. I, the, the other, um, so if we think about learning code at the bottom, which is how do we set and achieve academic goals? The one up on that is um, get paid to learn. So systemically, we should actually like fund tuition fully and have cheap housing and deal with many of the inequalities in the United States culture, but I don't see that changing anytime soon. So in the meantime, there are a bunch of skills that students can leverage to find money to pay for their school. That might mean decreasing their tuition bill by going to a community college and by finding other mechanisms to get a world-class ed education at a discounted price. And it also might mean scholarships and internships and work studies. Um, and so that second tier is really focused on that. And then the third tier is from the classroom to the bank, which is we learn how to learn and set and achieve academic goals. Once we are able to minimize the amount that we're paying for college, minimize our debt, you know, break that cycle, be able to afford tuition, how do we transform from our education into a career that we find valuable? So I call that from the classroom to the bank. And then the fourth level is actually, I would say like multi, there's multiple tiers on that horizon because it's really like, I would talk, call like on the job learning and that could be graduate school. It could be in my case, like professional problem solving skill for mathematician. It could be, uh, you know, how do you build a career full of professional development and personal growth? Um, how do you balance your time at work with the time that you have at home, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for the learning code, I imagine that a lot of the work that we'll, we can do is on that bottom level but of course, not this, none of this is, is linear, right? It's not, it's not like our lives like, oh, okay, I'm gonna learn to be a student and then I'm gonna learn how to pay for college. <laughs> and, then, and so a lot of the themes cross over, but in terms of serving students, which is really a central mission, when I think about the development stages of students, I like to think about their questions and their needs and their concerns in that continuum so that I can kind of, navigate the spaces of, of um, guidance, coaching, mentorship with the appropriate resources within that framework, right? Um, yeah. And so when I think about a lot of the, the curriculum development that we're doing, one of the things that I imagine in my own teaching, and this is something that I think you'll contribute to, and I know Steve and Henry have a lot to say about this also, something that really excites me is as we develop these resources, 
they hopefully will provide JTT just in time um, support. So when a student has a particular problem, part of our community has actually are, ha has some thoughts about those problems, some strategies, some ideas to further develop that student's opportunities for growth and to support them on that, that journey. Um, and I, I suppose the last part of this vision, so this is just kind of um, over the years, Henry and I and Steve have gone through this conversation multiple times. None of this is set in stone. The thing that I would say to you is the same thing I say to them is the same thing that I say to myself. I can guarantee that you have a ton of wisdom and guidance and great ideas and insights that are going to make this blossom in ways that I don't even know yet. The flip side is I tend to think that one of the hardest things to do is the act of creation. And it's so much easier to edit something that's created and to refine it than it is to like figure it out. On your, and, and so as a gift to this project, I, I'm, I'm basically gifting these ideas as a way to get us started on the, those six critical mission, you know, submissions of our mission statement with the explicit invitation to like make them better right like edit them uh one thing i always say to henry and steve is like i'm gonna say shit and you might fundamentally disagree with it and then like just come at it the flip side is i will i'm i'm not flippant so sometimes henry and steve had have, have said like challenge me and i fully agree with their challenge and then i change it and sometimes they'll challenge me and i fully agree with their challenge, but I'm not ready to change it because the underlying principle I actually am still committed to. And that's where really fun things happen because it ends up that like the way that they're thinking about it and the way that I'm thinking about it both have really, really uh, powerful values behind them. And so a lot of creative work happens in the in-between, like how do we align those values and how do we get that? Um, and so the last thing I'll say, I've talked a lot today, but you know, we're trying to catch, we, I think we've been working, to, I've been working with Henry and Steve for like four years, I think, three or four years. And we, we are so young in our uh, blessed time with you. And so it's just, there's a lot, right? Um, the last thing that I'll say is um, one, the way that I like to think about my blog posts, um, and this is not at all um, the way that Henry and Steve think about theirs, I think, um, though I tend to be able to, to make relationships. Um, when I was first thinking about the learning code, I created, um, let's see. A 60 video playlist, Jeff, the temporal video. Yeah. So, yeah. So one thing that I, I have never seen done. So talking about, you know, um, the more I worked in academia, the more I realized that famous researchers are the intersection of luck and good problems. <laughs> that, that's it. Like the researcher themselves is not that, you know, assuming that they're, they're willing to work hard and they have some privilege in their life. Like so much of being famous is like a ton of luck, right? Like systemic luck. So like they were born with light skins, so they weren't in segregated neighborhoods. That means their parents had good jobs. That means they had more, they had better ed access to education. That means, <laughs> so systemic luck and a little bit of personal luck. And then like, they got to a place where they got a really, really good problem before anybody else got to it. <laughs> and, then, and then people are like, whoa, genius. And I'm like, no, not genius. They were lucky and then they studied a problem before anybody else, right? Uh, yeah, given they worked hard, like I, I'll give that. So one of the things that I realized long ago was the the a great thing in academics is to try to find really good problems and find problems that very, very few people have studied in the form that I'm thinking about it. Because if I can do that, there's a chance that I can do some really unique work in that space, right? And so one of the problems that I've seen um, make a ton of money in our college education system is the problem of um, what does it mean to be a student or, you know, self-help in the space of being a professional college student? Two things that I've never seen done in that space are a really, really good analysis of racial hierarchies in the United States and what that actually means from the life of students, melded with 
cognitive science result in how learning works. And then the longer I thought about those two problems and then thought about students' life, I started to think temporarily, you know, time framed within a quarter. So a lot of self-help books are like what I would call like an amalgamation of individual study strategies. Whereas a lot of times what students really need is a specific strategy designed for a specific time in the quarter. So every academic term we have the day you sign up for classes, preterm preparations, the night before the first day, the first day of class, the first week of class, the second week of class, the third week of class. And then within the term itself, like each week has its own um, uh, time frame, right? So like a week, two weeks before the exam, a week before the exam, the day of the exam, the day after the exam. And so one of the things I thought about was if, if we could meld those two concepts and then structure it in a way that actually follows the student's life through a, a typical quarter. So if I'm thinking about this as like a 500 page uh, content delivery and workbook, it reminds me of this book. I don't know if you've ever seen this one. Jeff, would you like me to share that document? Yeah, let's can we get it. her on the on the shared Dropbox. Yeah, I can do that. Have you seen that book, Catherine? Sorry, can you um, read the title? I can't. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Writing right. your journal article in twelve weeks. 12 weeks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so this is a good one. I, I there's yeah, it's overwhelming, right? Um, I like this. I I think it's bullshit, <laughs> but but I like it. <laughs> Um, so like what she does is she goes week by week, I think it's a she, um, through these different systems to go from the kernel of an idea to a publishable article in 12 weeks. And so she basically systematizes the process of academic publication, which is pretty cool. Because it, what it means is that as a user of that book, instead of having to generate the strategy, what I can use is a predetermined strategy and then just pick and choose the ideas that work best for me. And so when I was thinking about the process of the learning code, one of the things I thought about is like, you know, here, here's a, a stupid and fast motto that I don't agree with, but it's kind of sexy from the standpoint of a commercial. How to get a 4.0 in 12 weeks. That's a stupid motto because that's not the goal of this, right? But like from the standpoint of of many students that are still discovering what a college education is and what they value, the, the idea would be like, if, if a, any student that's going through a quarter and they get to a particular place in the quarter and they're like, oh my God, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do here. We arc temporarily in the same way that they would incur, um, encounter it in their academic term, study skills that are grounded in learning science and that are race conscious so that they could literally just pick that study skill up and use it at that time, right? Um, and so that, that, if you wanted to share that, Henry, that, that's that document, that was the original kind of, um, and I, I've never really seen that done well. So in an academic term, the, I, I kind of broke it into different categories, like the preterm prep, the first week of classes, we'll, we'll get you access to all this stuff. And again, none of this is set, right? One of the major portions of that that I think is underdeveloped is non-STEM thinking. Like uh, I like to call mathematician, math teachers dream crushers <laughs> because we take the dreams of our students and crush them one by one, right? Um, and so I spent a, a huge majority of my time as an instructor thinking about how stupid the system is and thinking about how, um, how to make it better for students. And so that a lot of the, the structures that I think about in those contexts are based on STEM education. Um, and so I know I would be very, very curious and excited to see your perspectives and what you think should be added. And um, Henry's come up with some stuff in humanities that I think is really powerful, but um, those are kind of the general overviews of a lot of the work that we've been doing. Um, yeah. I talked way too much. <laughs> oh.
Um, one thing I'd like to maybe feature really quickly when I'm thinking about that list and the uh, end product of producing 60 videos and 60 blog pieces that support those uh, steps um, is this is something that I came across. So maybe I can do that now really quickly. So this is from Seth Godin's podcast. I've listened to about 50 episodes or so, but he features this um, testimony like in a lot of the 50 that I listen to and it and I see why. So he has this program called the Alt MBA, which is like a four week intensive course um, that he markets as superior to the regular MBA. <laughs> so, let me sh okay, I'm sharing my sound. So this is about a minute long. I'm gonna play it at um, 1.2 times speed. Get this out of the way. Okay, I'm gonna play it now. I just don't think it's possible or probable in, in today's world to distinguish yourself as an educational institution or as a success seeker at the level of, of information gathering or information distribution. I mean, this is the information age and you can get a great book, a great essay, a great idea anywhere, you know? And none of us can do that better than the internet, right? Um, there is no great thought leader who can outthink the internet. Like we have data. What all MBA gets right is it puts you in a context where you're part of a community that says, yeah, 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 that's good. You got access to ideas, you got access to information, that's awesome, but when are you gonna show up? When are you gonna face that blank page? When are you gonna face the possibilities within you? When are you gonna face those fears? I'm not gonna let you hide. You gotta show up. And that's the hardest part. And it sounds simple, it sounds very commonsensical, but it's the number one reason why we don't write that book. It's the number one reason why we don't ask that question. It's not because we don't know or we don't have the information. We don't have an environment and we don't have a support network that makes it feel like showing up is possible for me. Not just possible for the success stories I see out there, but I can show up. So the, the longer I reflect on that testimony, the more I realize that's what um, every educational institution <laughs> is, is there for. Like the idea of having an environment where there are, there are support networks and there are people who are working on that same walking on that same path to getting their degree or learning. Um, but in addition to the 60 videos and, and the blog posts that are centered around studying and learning, uh, I think we could achieve some type of maybe grassroots community through what we're trying to build in, in these meetings. And um, so that's just something to keep in mind because I've, had a few conversations with Catherine about grassroots community and what that really means. But like, what I'm trying to get at is, I can imagine a place where 60 videos are really polished on of, of that playlist, Jeff. And like, really, really, you know, videos are done, like really in interactive activities. Uh, but if students are left by themselves, like how, how most of my peers are in our upper division CS courses, there's still a ton of barriers in like actually you know, <laughs> picking those skills or picking those activities up and implementing them in their courses. So uh, th I, that's part of the reason why I think we're so focused on what does community mean and, you know, where can we derive real change? So, yeah. Yeah, Henry, I think that's a really great point because you know, at the beginning of this, Jeff, you were talking about how, you know, you, like in, in these sessions, it's not about the agenda, it's actually about the people. And I think Henry, what you're speaking to also echoes that, that for students, you know, you can have all of the resources, but having a community or as, um, as that podcast was putting it, you know, feeling like they're the conditions so that you can actually show up to do the work. A lot of that has to do with building a sense of community or feeling like you, uh, have the support. Um, and I think that this notion of like doing grassroots work and actually building communities as we're building resources as well, so that the resource resources aren't just like these material objects that, that we're producing, but there's a sense of wanting to have dialogue, wanting to communicate, wanting to be understood by other people and building friendships or relationships. I think that's really powerful and something that a lot of education systems don't actually get correct. Um, 
so yeah, universities are like, they exist so that we presumably do have these spaces where we can show up and do work, but the uni most universities, and I would argue K through 12 as well, they're structured around the individual and how, we can, how can we get the individual to advance in their individual career and professional success path instead of realizing that if we can work together and build together, we can mutually help each other to not only advance our individual interests, but our collective interests as well, which I think speaks to this structural change that Jeff was talking about before as well. How do we create systemic change? Well, you can't do that individually. It has to happen collectively through shared visions and sort of shared um, understandings that you're building together. I know both of you do that in your respective places, Jeff, in your class, right? When you, uh, Catherine, when you're tutoring with students. Um, and I'm like, I, I fundamentally understand you, you two are for sure working on that problem. And I see solutions to those problems in the conversations you have with students every single time I see you two working with students and working with a group of students. But I just think, you know, for the learning code, we let's continue to think of ways so that whether it's to encourage or inspire students to show up in addition to the resources that requires a creative solution <laughs> that is not easy, um, but yes. Steve, would you like to share some yep. thoughts? I was just gonna add that I think Jeff really early on, he realized this of, um, we're in a lucky spot because we kind of have the the guidance from Jeff and we're actually going, we're kind of also the market audience that we're trying to reach out to because we're going through the undergrad ourselves and we kind of have this resource of knowledge from Jeff and we're going through it. So I think it really helps and makes us come, come across as genuine because we're struggling with it too. It's not like a overnight fix, but if we can like document this and share it, I think it can really resonate with a lot of the audience. So a specific example might be Jeff's exam corrections or Jeff's uh, study skills activity, like uh, writing your own exam question. And I think I shared with you, Catherine, many of his exams are like fully written by my, by my classmates, right? Like just in those two things alone, there's another dozen I can list, but just in those two alone that make it, that make it feel so that students can show up in his class, right? But the reality is, ask me how many of my teachers are actually doing that in their classes. Not many, right? Like, I, I guess I have those skills in my back pocket now and I shouldn't exercise it because, you know, anticipating questions and doing all those things that we know to be effective when it comes to learning is valuable to make transparent. Um, but so much of, I think what I've been doing over the, at least in the last month or so is like, not just stating what they might do, or what we have done to be able to learn, but like really mm, critiquing and maybe even entertaining the fact that we've all been through some <laughs> real pain in these courses and in our academic journeys and just to connect with them on that level. Like, yeah. I, I love what you just said, Catherine, and I'm, I'm right with you. Um, I like your comment reminded me of this book, uh, Pedagogy of the Press by Paulo Fieri, um, and specifically the difference between the banking model of education, and I forget what the other, di dialogic, I suppose. Um, so that one of the really interesting things about that book is it it's a, a critical um, analysis, I suppose. It really critiques education systems and says it's all bullshit, basically. Like the banking model of education is the concept that you can have a pupil open their brain, which is an empty vessel and like just pour information into their brain and somehow that's how they get educated. And so he says that that's bullshit because that's not one, how people work. And two, it's actually really destructive. And this is how um, colonial systems basically look at the, um, look at the natives as uh, wild and savages and basically appropriate culture and resources to create generations of oppression. And he says that, you know, the, the point of his work was to help um, 
non-literate, so people that could not read, learn how to read. And he basically challenges the concept of the banking model by naming it, analyzing it, decomposing it, and then calling it bullshit. And then he says, oh, by the way, there's this other thing called dialogic education, which is looking at each person as a full human before working at them and then realizing that the interaction between teacher and student is as much a learning opportunity for the teacher as it is a student. But in order to get to that mutual learning, um, the fundamental mechanism by which we engage has to be a dialogue. It has to be a one-on-one. -on -one. And this is one of the reasons that I hold that practice in my classes that I wanna, if, if I could, I talk to every student for a minimum of an hour every day, except that I die at the end of the first week, right? I'd be, <laughs> uh, my goal is always don't die and don't get divorced. And so I have to like um, structure my life accordingly. But when I, you know, you what you just said, Catherine, is actually exactly how my heart resonates. The way that I would think about the resources are like the written language in Paulo Fieri's analysis. So when the two teacher and student come together in order to have a dialogue, it's around this concept of building literacy. And then the moment that that happens, each person brings their lived experience into that concept. And then the literacy is the reason, you know, is the purpose of the learning experience, but the real learning happens in the dialogue between. And so if I were to build the analogy of the learning code with Paulo Fieri's dialogic method of, of education, I would say like um, the written word is to Paulo Fieri's analysis, what the learning resources in the learning code are to the actual community that Henry's trying to build and the, you know, very, communal based relationship model that I think is so fundamental to this. The, the real, one of the real powers is to center learning on informed information about how learning works and about the systemic challenges that learners, learners face. But the real transformation happens in the dialogue between members in our community and the dialogue between the resources themselves and the learner themselves, right? And so I think your analysis is so cogent in that way. I'm, I'm uh. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, I really like what you just said because it, I mean, it also reflects like Frere's, like the way that they, like his system of actually teaching reading. Um, where the, the peasants who they were teaching reading to, they brought their experiences in order to learn how to read, right? So they, like, if you've, if you've read the, um, I don't remember which book it's in, but he actually shows you how, how, they, how they actually taught peasants how to read in like one day, which was they would start with pictures and then the peasants would bring in their experiences and because their experiences were political. They were, you know, they had all sorts of context. They were able to create stories about what they were seeing in these pictures. And then the tutors or the teachers could sort of help them with the language that, that they needed um, that was reflected in the stories they were bringing. So literally like the peasants were using their own stories to teach themselves how to read. And the pictures or the resource just became like this tool or um, like a medium through which those kinds of dialogues could happen. So the, the resource itself was not fetishized, but it was that the communication and the lived experiences that the peasants were bringing to their own learning to literally teach themselves how to read using their own stories. Um, yeah. This is where I get really excited because when I think about learning portfolios, I, what we've discussed, all four of us, um, about the what, why, how for each of our courses, part of me dies when I overhear conversations of students saying that they can't wait to get done with their GEs or why do we have to take this class or that class? It's like, but actually if you apply the scope of what, why, how to anything you learn, including your GE courses, or including doing taxes, like it doesn't have to be so painful uh, and it could be really rich. So like maybe the 10 year vision, imagine a place where we can have our own little wiki, right? Of, of like 
content generated by students navigating or having navigated the system. I just, because that testimony that I shared with, um, from Godin student, that's so not present right now <laughs> over my last year at San Jose State. Like it's, it's not present at all, right? So even when students, I guess part of my worry is even when students do become conscious of the study skills, if they fall into those self-destructive narratives and deficit thinking, I don't think they're gonna tap into those study skills. So yeah, when I think about what both of you just said, um, I've, I've been thinking about like, you know, I, I've shared that I'm serious about hopefully inspiring students to become content creators. And, and I think many of them do that already um, in their courses, right? And like having to learn in the courses to just pass for sure they're, you know, doing so many of the studying things that we are preaching them to do. Steve, what are your thoughts on my um, idea of like the portfolio turning into like a learning I, I, had, I, I thought I saw Steve, I thought I saw something, I saw a spark there. I was actually just writing because when you're talking about the portfolio, I just think of students like kind of documenting themselves and just the, it really helps with like the process of just reflection. And I know we have that one term was the unreflective learning that we're, uh, that we're trying to avoid. Yeah. So we want to have reflective learning and you kind of gave me the idea. And especially because we've been talking about media and all these things kind of want to try to document my quarter as much as I can this upcoming quarter. Like it's kind of something uncomfortable, almost like vlog, like what I'm doing, how I'm studying. And like, maybe in like my first video would be like, can I get a 3.7 GPA this quarter? And like, just as if I was talking to a community and I had a whole bunch of people, I mean, I do have a community here, but uh, just that documentation is getting me I'm just excited for this upcoming quarter um, and I need to do a lot of capturing and then I need to catch up to you guys, but uh, you guys are just inspire me right now. I come up with good ideas when I hear you guys talk. That's, so I was just writing these things down. Um, yeah, I love that concept of not fetishizing the resource. Um, one thing that I struggle with big time is the, the idea of amateur instruction, um, that many of the instructors are not professional instructors. They're, they're, they're no more than content experts who kind of a, um, as, as a mechanism to keep the university funded. And I, I, because of that, one of the reasons that I like the idea of grounding a lot of the study skills in theory of learning is it's a way to counteract negative narratives that instructors will tell themselves about what their students should be doing from a space of ignorance, right? Um, many of the instructors I had had specific ideas of how I should be studying that were not grounded in any knowledge of the science of learning, but instead grounded in their lived experience, which is not a bad thing, but the plural of, of data, uh, anecdote is not data, right? And so I like the idea of like having students be able to say like, okay, this suggest like, so for example, the pace that Henry, you talk about a lot this quarter, that pace is actually detrimental to learning, right? It's hard to know that until we recognize how much time and energy learning takes and the fact that learning requires deliberate practice and distributed practice and many other things. And then all of a sudden we can analyze that system knowing the results from the science of learning. We can say, okay, that system is actually detrimental to learning. Doesn't mean we we don't we can somehow escape the navigation piece if we have that goal of finishing, but it does mean we can analyze it from a critical lens and actually see some of the components that should change, right? Um, I, I have a meeting at four that I'm going to get to, but I did want to follow up from last week. Henry and Steve, you guys said um, it would be really fun if we were to write more often. I agree. Um, so this, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out, but I think they can follow uh, keep you informed of this, Catherine. Um, here is a proposal that I have. I would love us to have scheduled 
through the end of June or even mid July blog posts once a week, Fridays at 6 p.m. And I'd like us to, to do the thing where we're sharing the blog posts. So, you know, one Friday's Henry, one Friday's Steve, one Friday's Jeff, Catherine. Um, we offer the opportunity, but because we're still onboarding, like how many, how many months did it take us to do a, a weekly blog post? <laughs> a year? <laughs> yeah, so like the, the, the opportunity and option is there, but like let, we want you to have the chance to like sell yourself, right? So we, we have a schedule already predetermined right now. And as you gear up and as you feel excited, like, and whenever you're ready, if you're ready today, great. If you're not ready today, great. There's no pressure. Um, one thing that I would say though, Steve, is I don't want us individually to write more than two blog posts for this blog per month, because I think if we're doing that, we're missing opportunities to do some deep reading for this purpose, right? And then the other thing is, if I think about the mission as not only a learning code, but inspiring each of us individually, I would challenge each of us to write four blog posts a month, two of which are for the learning code. And could you guess what the other two are for? Our own portfolio. Your own portfolios, right? Which means that the learning code really focuses on the learning portion of it. And then each of us builds our own blog focused on a topic, which means, I mean, four blog posts a month is a pretty heroic effort. What's nice if we, if each of us were to be right at Catherine, don't trip about any of this. Like you're, you're like three months into the writing process for the learning code. So like you like slow and steady, right? Like always slow and steady. And if we had to take the option of deliverables versus community, the fact that you're here today is like 150% of any expectation. Right. And that's every, every single time. Right. Each of us have opted into this challenge as a way to grow our brains and our skills. And I think you're opting into this challenge also, but I was just responding to Steve. Steve was like, can we write one a week? And I think that's awesome. But imagine if we, as a team, each of us wrote two, a month, two per four weeks, there's three of us and soon to be four of us, that's eight posts a month in the learning code, right? That's a lot. Like that's, that's plenty. Right? Like, I don't think our readers are going to be able to keep up with that, right? If they're normal human beings. And so I really like the idea that yes, one, let's write more, but we don't get to publish more than one post a, a month until each of us doesn't get to publish more than one post a week, uh, every three weeks, sorry, until all of our posts are scheduled through the end of July. Do you know what, or the end of June? Do you know why I choose the end of June? Summer. It's the summer, right? <laughs> like, yeah, like, that means that no, no exams, no grading, no et cetera, right? Um, and then the other thing that I would say is the opportunity, and Catherine, this is a little bit beyond where we are as a team at this moment, but just as a, like, I would say that if you want to write more often, my goal in the coming weeks would be to write one post a, a week. Two of those each four weeks is for the learning code. Two of them are for my personal blog, right? So that not only are we doing work associated with this team, but we're also building our individual capacities because I fundamentally, I, I want this to be a growth period. And so I'm now late, but I just wanted to, to um, kind of reflect. I'll shut up there. Yeah, it's great to see you, Catherine. Steve and Henry, always great to see you. Bye, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Bye. Catherine, you need yes. to take off, right? I actually do because I also have a four o'clock ish meeting. <laughs> okay. Okay. But thank, thank you. you, thank you so much to both of you for for having me and um, for letting me be in these meetings. I'm, I know I've said this a lot, but I'm really excited and I have a lot to learn from from both of you and from Jeff. But I'm just really glad that we'll be in in dialogue with each other. Me too. I know the end was a little overwhelming about blogging and stuff, but. As I've been editing like those one minute clips, each one minute clip is about four to five sentences potentially. So like, since you did like a few of those today, you already started <laughs> drafting, right? Uh, uh, like maybe not blog, but like a, yeah, just when I think about the outreach and impact, I think a lot of the one minute clips from our meetings can positively impact more students than what I think you, you, you all think at the moment, but you will see soon. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks.